Welcome to Mortification of Spin, a casual conversation about things that count with Carl Truman and Todd Pruitt, a podcast of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Let's join this week's conversation. You are listening to Mortification of Spin. My name is Todd Pruitt. I'm the pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and I'm joined as always by my friend and co-host Carl Truman, who, uh, in addition to being a professor at Grove City College, is also um, a fellow of various sorts and sundry organizations, um, uh, frequently um, uh, speaking in secret meetings in the Pentagon, um oh, yes. and um mi5 and various other intelligence ag- agencies around the world um he can't even tell me at risk of of death um all that he does but um uh carl it's great uh great to see you as always how's uh, how's everything going now are, are are you currently underground in the pentagon or are you back at home in western pennsylvania <laughs> i'm back home in western pennsylvania but i wasn't held at, up at gunpoint this week um oh that's good it makes a change i always you know every, right. any week when i'm not held at gunpoint mm-hmm. is a good mm-hmm. week as far as let me ask you, Carl. You know, because we yeah. talked about this uh, a few weeks ago. Your your um, your experience being held at, at gunpoint has has that at all made you a, a little bit more? Um, well, I don't know. Have you warmed up a bit more of, of the potential of 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 becoming a gun gun owner, um, having a concealed carry license? Because I'm I'm wanting to see kind of what kind of progress you're making. It, it, being interesting, an I American. Have. I actually think my experience that night was it, it was sort of irrelevant to that question on the grounds that I feel if I got out of the car with a gun on my hip, the guy would just have shot me. I, I don't think he'd have hesitated. I think mm. I would be dead. But but if so you I, were properly trained, Carl, I think we could have fixed that, don't you it, think? I did the James Bond thing. I stood there in my tuxedo, poured myself a martini, and uh, talked him <laughs> off the ledge. <laughs> <laughs> Explain to him what a big mistake it would be to shoot you. <laughs> you you really don't want to do this. I said, you know, Say, you, really, I, you know, you I've really got friends in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, who are not allowed to tell anybody about what they actually do. They'll come yeah. for you if, if you harm the, me. The president, like the president of Grove actually said to me, we need to sue this guy. You can't <laughs> do that even in Texas. And I said, you know, <laughs> I, I think Nigerian gangs have extrajudicial ways of handling people who try to sue them. So we decided yeah. not to uh, not to pursue the case any further. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, well, yeah. I, I just, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I want our listeners to know that you and I are men of danger. Uh, we live exciting, fascinating, risky yeah, lives, yeah. and I think that's important for our listeners. Well, I love that I've, at least one student's come up to him in Grove Campus and says, Dr. Truman, I gather somebody tried to assassinate you the other <laughs> week. And that sounds really cool, I think. Yeah, no Survived doubt. Survived a, 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 an assassination. Professor, attack. writer, lecturer, assassination survivor. I love it. Yes, I yes. It. Okay. Well, cool. You better introduce our guest anyway. I, I should. I should. Well, um, we are excited uh, and thankful for uh, the presence of our, our of our guest today. Um, she, along with uh, David Dockery, have uh, written a wonderful new book called "Created in the Image of God: um, Applications and Implications for the Cultural Confusion." Her name is Laura McAfee. Um, uh, Laura is, I mean, you know, she's good Southern Baptist, so you know that's my roots, and 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 not only that, but she lives in in my former home where I was a youth pastor uh, in Oklahoma City. Um, so she no doubt has some wonderful tornado stories. Um, but uh, she's uh, author of a number of different books. Uh, she's currently in pro- in process of receiving a PhD from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. Um, she is the founder of Stand for Life. She serves as ministry uh, director of uh, for, for ministry investments at uh, Hobby Lobby, which is based out of Oklahoma as well. And uh, now she is the co-author of this book, the content of which um, we are excited to talk to her about. Lauren, thanks for uh, coming on with us. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you guys. Excellent. Well, after the introduction, I wasn't sure if you would feel that way, but I'm glad I'm glad you're <laughs> hanging on. Um, so, uh, you know, first of all, w- when we have authors on, one of the things we like to kind of talk about is, you know, why this subject? Why now? Um, I think we can all imagine why it's so important, but uh, um, kind of talk to yeah. us about how how you and and Dr. Dockery kind of zeroed in on this subject and and what generated your interest in it. Yeah, so so my intro into kind of 
the image of God, human dignity issues starts for me way back in 2012, whenever I, I'm a part of the Green family that owns and operates Hobby Lobby. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, David Green, is the founder and my father, uh, Steve Green, is the president mm -hmm. of Hobby Lobby. And back in 2012, there was this, this thing called Obamacare, this um, uh, mandate, this government mandate that was requiring all companies and organizations to provide and pay for um, particular drugs and devices as a part of the insurance plan that were considered contraceptive. Um, there were 20 that were categorized as contraceptive. Uh, four of those, though, did have an abortifacient mm -hmm. component to them. And so for our family, owning a, owning a business, privately owned business, we were faced with a situation where we were going to be, we were being forced and required by the government to provide and pay for abortifacient, these abortifacient drugs and devices. And that went against our convictions about the value of life and protecting all of life and including life in the womb. And so as a family, we really had to grapple with what what do we do here where, you know, our government is forcing it, saying that we have to do this. This goes against our faith convictions. Um, if we did not provide the, the, you know, kind of follow this mandate, then we were as a company going to be fined $1.2 million a day. And that was going to be unsustainable. So my family got together, all three generations of us in the green family that were over the age of 18. And uh, as a family decided Okay, what are we going to do? And that ended up becoming the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case of 2014 that was decided and Hobby Lobby was um, granted the ability to practice our religious convictions and mm -hmm. and operate as a business, not having to provide those those um, those four drives and devices and have to pay for those personally. So that experience really set me on a path toward wanting to um, understand better our convictions about pro-life. What do we believe about human dignity? What do we, why do we believe that life in the womb is valuable or any life is valuable? Um, and understanding, you know, all life is being created in the image of God is, is a huge part of that. So, so from that journey, that is a kind of long way of saying that <laughs> led me on a path where I eventually founded an organization, um, called Stand for Life, where we partner with churches and pro-life organizations and try and think well about what does it mean to theologically um, disciple individuals to understanding the value of life? What does it mean to disciple individuals and churches for how to engage well to be a pro-life church and to care about women, to care about babies, to care about families? And so as we were creating resources, Dr. Dockery and I, we're uh, realizing the need for also to create some academic level resources for pastors and church leaders um, and academics to be able to read and really think through what are the implications of being made in the image of God? What is that theological concept? How can we apply that to the current moment we find ourselves in in our culture? And so um, my organization partnered with Dr. Dockery's organization and we put on a, an event, uh, just a two-day event with lectures and papers given by scholars from around the country, writing about this topic, kind of ap applying it to their specific area of expertise. And it was just a really lovely event, um, mm -hmm. you know, professors, scholars, church leaders from around the country coming together and, and focusing on kind of this image of God concept. And the papers that were presented there are what became the chapters for this book that is, is now out called Created in the Image of God. So Dr. Dockery and I got to be the editors on this series and um, bring together these articles. And Dr. Dockery wrote one as well. And I got to write along with um, a friend. Uh, we co-authored one of the articles as well. So it's a really lovely compilation of experts in this field, theological experts, ethicists, applying the image of God concept to their area of expertise, as I mentioned. And that is kind of how this book came to be. So it's it's available now and people can order it and hopefully it'll be a great resource for church leaders um, as well as just everyday um, people who are wanting to mm -hmm. think about what does it mean to be created in the image of God and how do we apply that to our current moment in history? Because we're going to talk well about abortion. We, we, we have to bring it back to the fundamental issues like 
what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to bear the image of God? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 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 I mean, it's interesting. It's 80 years ago this year that uh, C.S. Lewis gave the the lectures that became the abolition of man. Mm-hmm. And really there at the, sort of the height of the Second World War, he identified the the crisis of the modern age as an anthropological crisis. Mm-hmm. And really, we don't know what it means to be human anymore. Lauren, I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on you. Know, I, I imagine a lot of people are listening to this program thinking, well, we're Christians. Yeah, we believe human beings are made in the image of God. And we certainly think that that connects to the abortion debate. We, that's certainly where we would go if we were arguing. But what are the other pressing issues in our culture that make this you know, it's not just a life issue, it seems to me, the image of God. It has implications in a whole host of other areas. Could you sort of open up uh, a few of those those areas for yeah. us? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, you're right. It does apply, of course, to the pro-life issue. And that's kind of was my introduction to caring about this, was thinking about it through that lens. But it applies to many issues that we're facing in culture today. Uh, both issues that matter to people and people are doing advocacy for, as well as just issues that are affecting our culture in significant ways. So some of the articles that are in this book are relating to what it means as as created as relational beings. And so Jennifer Marshall Patterson is a, is a really lovely author and speaker, and she writes about the relational aspect and how we were created for a relationship as a part of our image bearerness. Um, Greg Allison talks about embodiment. So how can we think well about the fact we are embodied people and that is a part of who we are as a part of our identity. So as created as image bearers, we are embodied people. And and the implications of that. And Greg Allison's a a, a systematic or historical theologian, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's, he's written a a book on this topic and is excellent. So he's kind of distilled kind of the highlights into his chapter here. Uh, There's also, you know, what it means to be male and female, what it means to, deal with artificial intelligence and transhumanism. Uh, so Jacob Schatzner wrote on that, and that is an area that I hadn't really thought much about. And he does an excellent job of, of applying how do we think about what it means to be a person in an age where we have artificial persons and artificial mm-hmm. intelligence and grappling with that. But then there are also issues that we think about in culture, such as um, the, the trafficking issue, where people mm-hmm. are being dehumanized and commodified or pornography, where again, people are something to be um, commodified and enjoyed and not seen for their full human dignity, and racism and and sexism, and and all of these issues where really at the root of it, we are dehumanizing someone that is different than us, or dehumanizing for the sake of our own <clears throat> pleasure. Lauren, um, th- the whole idea of you know, what is meant when the scriptures refer to the image of God has been a, a subject of, of great theological exploration, in some cases debate, also a lot of agreement. Um, as you look at kind of the the, the book and the, the various um, sort of facets that are explored about this rich doctrine of the image of God, um, how how would you kind of summarize uh, that doctrine and, and 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 what would be maybe some some of the key components of what we're talking about when we talk about the the image of God clearly we're not talking about a a physical reflection so there's something you know different from that so mm-hmm. as 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 you kind of look at what various contributors bring uh to, to the discussion um um you know what? What? Yeah. What is the scripture no, getting at question. there? When it? When it? When it? I mean, clearly, this is something magnificent because nothing else in the universe is tagged mm-hmm. as having as being made in the image of God, and so there's something really spectacular about this. Um, what do we kind yeah, of see right. from the various contributors? Yeah. So I love the way that Dr. Dockery summarizes this by saying that men and women, because they're created in the image of God, have rationality, morality, spirituality, and personality. So there's this. It's kind of identity that is given Mm -hmm. to men and women as image bearers that gives this uniqueness that is different than all of the rest of creation. So Mm -hmm. in Genesis 1, you have the creation account. God is creating everything in the world. And then he pauses and has a conversation with himself as the Trinity. 
So God creates man and woman. He says, let us create man and woman in our image. And, and so man and woman are unique in that. So we're image bearers, which means that we are bearing the very image of God. It doesn't mean we are God, of course, but there's something unique about us separating us from all of creation. And it is given to both man and woman equally. So there's this equal dignity and value and uniqueness that can be found for all of humanity. So it pl- applies to each of us individually, as well as for the whole of humanity. So our, our human dignity, our concept of the value of human life is something that is innate. I mean, that's something that, you know, people instinctively can sense this value of life. And I believe that's because of our identity as image bearers, that we, we know the value, we can sense that in ourselves and in one another. And this, this application can be beautiful when it is kind of applied correctly and applied rightly for our world. That, that I believe is a beautiful gift that of the teaching of the scripture that we can live out and share with the world. And that is a, is a gift of common grace. Whenever believers are living out this understanding that all people have value, regardless of things that they might want to place value on. So regardless of your, your status, your finances, your skin color, where you live in the world, uh, nothing determines our value as humans it is given to us. It is something that is spoken into us as image bearers and that can't be taken away. So that's really freeing for believers, Mm -hmm. for for every individual to believe that can uh, really be transformative as we see our own value and our own dignity as image bearers and someone that God has created and, and knows. And so then as we live that out and apply that to our culture, that also reflects the beauty of God's goodness as we give that same value and dignity to others. So I, I believe this is an incredibly powerful doctrine that if we live out well, has amazing and beautiful implications in the way that we care for all people, especially the vulnerable and those who may be seen as less valuable. And we we show the value that they have. So there are a number of ways that the book kind of defines some of that. Dr. Dockery does a great job of kind of giving specifics to how that is applied, but also uh, Dr. John Kilner, he's written an entire book on kind of human dignity and the image of God that is an incredible resource. But in his chapter in our book, he really defines that as both giving us identity in terms of kind of who we are, as well as connection with God. So as we, as people are image bearers of something, it connects us with what we are imaging. And so we are to image God and, and that gives us a connection with him. And so in our identity, we are to also see ourselves for the connection that we have with our creator and, our, and who we are imaging. And for believers, we have that direct connection and relationship through Jesus Christ. And Christ is the ultimate image of God, the, the perfect image bearer. Um, and so, yeah, so those are some of the ways that we kind of think through what that means to be an image bearer. And, and how that can apply to each of us individually. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, Laura. It seems to me that one of the things that that's implied by uh, a lot of what you're saying is that the church has, has kind of neglected this doctrine. I, you know, it, it is a doctrine. You know, I, I think if you ask any Christian who's read any theology at all, are we made in the image of God? You're going to get the answer, yes. But the implication of what you're saying is that we've sort of paid lip service to that or it's been one of our basic Christian intuitions without us fully understanding the richness, the practical implications of that. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the church has not made as much of this rather glorious uh, doctrine as she should have done? Yeah, well, that is that is the good question to ask because we can see in our world that this hasn't always been upheld. And actually, John Kilner, you know, in his chapter explains some of the ways that even in the name of Christianity, in the name of, of uh, God, people have misused this and made up their own, an own version of the image of God that applied it more strongly to some people groups than others mm-hmm. and diminished the dignity of others. Um, and, and so there are ways that in the name of again this faith people have misused this under this understanding of the image of god but we we look at scripture for the truth and 
And I think that because of the fall, because of sin, I mean, you know, Genesis one gives us this beautiful um, image of God language. And then two chapters later, we get to Genesis three and the fall happens and sin enters the world. So while sin has affected each of us, uh, each of us as image bearers, it doesn't take away our image bearer identity, but it does affect how we engage in the world and relate to one another because it is affected by sin. And so um, because of because of sin, people want to dehumanize others for the sake of making ourselves feel greater. And and this happens in, in so many ways in culture. So with 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 believers, we have the challenge of applying this holistically and in a way that gives the full beauty of the doctrine by applying it equally and seeing everyone for who they are as an image bearer. And, and, and the power in that is significant. It can be incredibly powerful when we do that well. Uh, and John Kilner also says on the other side, it can be incredibly destructive whenever we don't apply that well. And whenever we try to dehumanize others, it's incredibly damaging. And we've seen the effects of that um, in, in, you know, you look at history and events where whole groups of people were um, seen to be as less than human and were not seen for their mm-hmm. full dignity and just the, the destruction and the harm that is caused by that. So mm-hmm. then on the alternate, you have people like Martin Luther King Jr., who as a believer, as a Baptist minister, saw the value and saw the truth of this and said, no, people have equal value and we should be treating each other as such. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, I just read Hang Noor's um, really powerful book on his, his account. He wrote it back in the uh, mid 1980s um, of his survival of the Khmer Rouge regime in, in Cambodia, where um, the communist party of Cambodia um, led by Pol Pot um, oversaw the deaths of, depending on who you speak to, anywhere from 1.5 to, to 2.5 million people, um, anywhere from a, a quarter to a third of, of the country's population. And one of the things you found in the documents of the Khmer Rouge and the public statements um, was this constant uh, dehumanization language of of whole groups. And of course, we see this in other totalitarian regimes. And the, the 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 point being is that the justification for murder is that is that these are lesser people. They're either non-humans or they're lesser humans. And as much as we like to think that, well, that's the you know that's the property of you know Nazis and Khmer Rouge and and that sort of thing. Um, it's it's quite another thing though when you hear that spoken by contemporary, sophisticated, you know, um, quote liberal. Uh, Westerners seeking to uh, justify abortion, for instance, um, where they can no longer do what they used to do in the late 60s and early 70s, refer to the unborn as uh, not a human life. They know they can't do that justifiably anymore. And so they've adopted the language of, yes, it's a human life, but it's not a human person. And what is so chilling about that is it sounds so much like the language used in the earlier parts of the 20th century where it was where similar language was used to exterminate people mm-hmm. on very large scale mm-hmm. and so it's like you know kind of we 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 rediscover old ways to do new evil yeah um, that's and it's right. attack, it's attack on it's an attack you know over and over again on on the image yeah. bearers of of god that whole notion that yeah. there isn't something yeah. intrinsically valuable about right. the human life in, right. in, there's, in every stage. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And so uh, humans, we will continue to find ways to um, uh, engage in harmful and sinful things because of the state of our world. And so, right, you're right. And, you know, this is, there have been for millennia ways that people have dehumanized others and in our culture. There are many ways that that happens. And as you mentioned, specifically the unborn, mm-hmm. that's that's an area I'm very passionate about and engaged in and hearing about thinking through personhood. And for believers, I think our challenge is to be able to advocate well for the dignity of all people. And hopefully this book is a great resource that will help people think through yeah. various ways that mm-hmm. this, this understanding, this biblical concept applies to the current cultural moment we find ourselves in. 
whether it's the sanctity of life, whether it's how we think about technology and the developments that we have, whether it's you know how we think about embodiment. There's so many great, great articles that I do hope this will be a resource because it is, as I mentioned, just a beautiful teaching, a beautiful doctrine that as as believers live this out well, shares just the incredible beauty of God and his goodness. Yeah. Carl, I was thinking, it, 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 you know, just in terms of so much, so much of the work you've done the last couple of years, um, you know, the transgender movement and the idea of of the plasticity of the self, you know, as you think about the image of God, um, un, un, unless you want to take complete liberty with, with words and ideas, um, uh, the, the, if, 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 if I embrace at least in a general sense, this, this idea of being in the image of God, that does kind of place limits. It, it places certain boundaries around how I can think about myself. Yeah. yeah? It, it, it makes human nature normative. And I yeah. think you, you, and it also makes it embodied. And I think that's one mm-hmm. of the, the great things about this book is that I think it will help our listeners to think through some of these key issues. So you were talking just a few moments ago, you know, alluding to, to the Nazis that reminded me of, I don't know if it was Philip Reeves father or grandfather who insisted on being taken back to Israel to be buried after he died. Mm. He did not want to be buried in America because he said Hitler had won in the West. Mm. And what he meant was the notion of human beings having dignity provided by them being made in the image of God was gone. Mm. And that was really the basis for the Nazi uh, genocide of the Jews. So wow. anyway, it's been great interviewing you, Lauren. Thanks very much for, for coming on. Um, well, thanks we hope- for having me. Yeah, we hope that the air in Wyoming gets a little bit more. <laughs> Most of us hate humidity, but it sounds like you could yes. do a little bit of humidity in Wyoming. <laughs> I we could, do, yes. We yeah, do want to I recommend do. your book to our listeners. Uh, it's entitled uh, Created the Image of God. It's co-edited by the great David Dockery and Lauren McAfee. Uh, if you would like to enter for a chance to win a copy of the book, please go to our website, mortificationofspin.org, where that would be possible. Uh, and while you are there, if you feel that, please do make a donation. We are a listener-supported podcast. In the meantime, all that remains is for me to thank our guest, Lauren, for joining us this afternoon, and to thank you all for listening. We look forward to being with you next time. Thanks for listening to Mortification of Spin, a podcast of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. For more on topics like this, visit mortificationofspin.org, where you can find other articles by Carl and Todd, browse the archive of past episodes, and make a donation. We'll talk to you next time on Mortification of Spin. Mortification of Spin.